Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. We'll be starting the program shortly, waiting for some folks to join. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. We are gonna wait a minute or two before we start the program. We will be starting in just another minute here, waiting for folks to join. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Mark Hefflinger. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the communications director and digital director for the Bold Alliance, which includes Bold Nebraska and the newly launched Pipeline Fighters Hub, which was created to serve as an online and in real life resource uh, to provide expertise to the wider networks of water protectors and pipeline fighters who are organizing locally today to stop pipelines and other risky fossil fuel projects in their communities. Um, in addition to our website, which you can find at pipelinefighters.org, which has an outline and links to engage with grassroots and frontline organizers on some of the major pipeline fights happening right now, um, and tons of catalog resources on fighting eminent domain, organizing to stop a pipeline, and enacting protections at the city and county level. Um, I also publish a daily email newsletter called Extracted, that you can subscribe to, which has news clips and updates relevant for pipeline fires and water protectors. Um, we'll include a link to subscribe to the extracted newsletter in the follow-up email after today's briefing. Um, and today we're now excited to launch this uh, webinar briefing series as another pipeline fighters hub re resource, uh, which we'll be hosting monthly. Uh, the first pipeline fighters hub briefing today is gonna to be on the topic of carbon capture and a proposed massive network of CO2 pipelines that would be needed to advance this new and as yet largely unproven technology, which the fossil fuel industry uh, has started to position as a holy grail or Hail Mary of sorts, basically to allow it to keep extracting and burning and producing uh, more emissions for as long as possible while ignoring our climate crisis. Um, we're also excited to announce that the topic for uh, next month's pipeline fire sub briefing uh, will be on recent pipeline fighter wins um, and feature some panelists from canceled projects, including Keystone XL, and talking about some of the loose ends um, that organizers on the ground, um, like water protectors facing legal battles, still landowners with eminent domain and easements, 
and uh, those city ordinances that folks are fighting for. Um, now for a bit of housekeeping and uh, the briefing for today's agenda, uh, we'll introduce our panelists, we'll give about a 10 minute presentation each, and then we'll have a Q&A segment. Um, there should be closed captioning enabled at the bottom of your screen. If you can't see it, you can click the setting on Zoom and we'll be offering a recording of today's program for folks who are registered. Um, for questions, we're gonna use the Q&A feature on Zoom here today for you to type your questions in so your camera and your audio is off. You don't have to worry about being on camera. Um, you can click uh, at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button. And uh, at any time you can type a question, we'll try and get to as many as we can during the uh, discussion later. If you're on the phone, you can also email a question to mark, M-A-R-K at boldnebraska.org. And we'll try to get to some of those at the end today. Uh, to introduce our panelists, I'll turn over now to my colleague, uh, Jane Kleb. Jane's the president of Bold Alliance and founder of Bold Nebraska, which if you did not know, uh, we helped organize the farmers, ranchers, tribal nations, and uh, environmental advocates and community who fought the Keystone XL pipeline for over a decade. Uh, and Jane also now serves as chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party. Uh, take it away, Jane. Thank you, Mark. And hello, fellow pipeline fighters and water protectors that are tuning in from across the country. I even heard a fellow pipeline fighter tell me that they were going to have date night tonight uh, watching the webinar uh, with their partner. So that is a committed pipeline fighter that is definitely enjoying wine and date night as we talk about the new threat of a new pipeline, carbon pipelines. I think a lot of us have so many questions and I know our three experts tonight are gonna help get some facts out there. And then we're also gonna talk about organizing and answering your questions. It feels like we're in a moment where we were about 10 to 15 years ago when fracking came on the scene. You saw a lot of unions and a lot of democratic establishment jump on board and even some environmental groups jump on the fracking train. And you had some committed folks, especially those on the front lines who knew that their water and their homes were going to be at risk with fracking projects, raising that red flag. That's what I feel like we're in right now, is that folks who normally are our allies are saying that carbon capture pipelines is part of the solution to the climate crisis. And I think after tonight, when you listen to our experts and listen to the questions and answers, we'll all come to the conclusion that this is yet another false promise from big oil threatening our communities and the folks who would have to shoulder the responsibility of all of the risk are the farmers, the ranchers, the landowners, the tribal nations, the frontline communities who are always the ones who are asked to shoulder the burden. Bold Alliance and the Pipeline Fighters Hub are going to be here for any community that is taking on the fight. Landowners in Nebraska, who just had about a month to celebrate the final victory of Keystone XL, are now getting letters right now from one of the carbon capture pipeline companies asking to do land surveys across their land. So we have no time to sit back and enjoy the fact that some pipelines are being stopped. Our brothers and sisters in Minnesota are still fighting line three, and we have several other pipeline fights that are close to being won, but we still have to continue to organize, including Jordan Cove and, and a couple other pipelines like Mountain Valley Pipeline. But I wanna just remind folks that it can be depressing when you look at the congressional budget that includes $12 billion for carbon capture pipelines and carbon capture projects. That may seem like we are up against an insurmountable hill that is gonna be impossible to climb. But we have seen that hill before, we have climbed that hill before, and we are going to do it again. We're gonna use the same unlikely alliances, we're gonna organize landowners, we're gonna respect the frontline communities, and we're gonna make sure that our voices are finally heard to the top of the administration with, the Biden, with President Biden, as well as all of our local county and state boards to ensure that these carbon pipelines do not go through. So I'm really happy to invite our first speaker, Carol Muffett, who is the president of the Center for an International Environmental Law. He was a, a former staff member of Greenpeace. 
And if you aren't familiar with CIEL, which is what they go by in kind of the activist world, they're an organization that uses law in order to protect the land and water. They have one of the best pieces out right now on carbon capture pipelines and all of the risks, as well as the financial models that big oil and big gas are using to push these projects through. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carol. Thanks, thanks so much, Jane. Um, and I'm really excited to be sharing this with all of you tonight. And because you are the pipeline fighters, I wanna start this presentation with a quick video clip that shows you what you're really up against. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about CO2 pipelines running through your communities. And so if you remember nothing else from what I say in the next 10 minutes, I'd love for you to remember this video. This video shows a rupture of a buried, dense phase carbon dioxide pipeline. The experiment was conducted in the safe environment of the DMBGL spade out of testing and research center to assess the consequences of such ruptures in terms of mass outflow, greater formation, and dense gas dispersion. The viewer should note that the extent of the visible plume does not necessarily represent the extent of the dense gas hazard. That was a controlled test in an isolated area. It's important to remember because the next CO2 rupture that you see is unlikely to be controlled and it's unlikely to be in an isolated area. The IPCC tells us that to have any chance to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees we need to begin eliminating CO2 emissions immediately, cutting them by 45% by 2030, um, and, to, and to have the best chance of, of avoiding 1.5, we need to cut by nearly 60% by 2030 and 97% by 2050. And that means eliminating coal, eliminating oil, and eliminating gas. And so the question becomes, why is Exxon still so happy? And the answer is because Exxon is out and pushing strategies that will allow it to go on producing oil, producing gas, producing petrochemicals indefinitely into the future under the guise of carbon capture and storage and similar strategies. Exxon's argument and the arguments of Shell and Chevron and other oil and gas companies is that they can use these negative emissions to go on emitting and make the carbon magically disappear from the atmosphere. And the truth is the carbon may magically disappear from their accounting books, but it's not gonna be disappearing from the atmosphere. So how does CCS, how is CCS supposed to work? The idea is that we go on burning fossil fuels, we go on with other high emitting activities and, and we equip smokestacks, we equip, we equip industrial facilities with equipment to suck that carbon back out of the atmosphere, pump it tens to hundreds to thousands of miles, and then re-inject it and ostensibly safely store it underground. As James said, this is getting a lot of traction, not only with our opponents, but with many people in the Democratic Party and even a few in the environmental community. And we saw the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was introduced at the end of July include more than $25 billion in subsidies for CCS and related false solutions that are primarily intended to support fossil fuels. But CCS faces a real problem. For two decades, CCS has been a cure in search of a disease. CCS was originally proposed as the only way the nation would get off coal. But the truth is the nation is, is getting off coal relatively rapidly. And similarly, CCS was going to be 
the, the, the companion to the short-term bridge that natural gas was supposed to be, but was never intended to be. And even there, it's not working. And part of the reason it's not working is that renewables are outcompeting natural gas and coal virtually everywhere for two thirds of the planet. Renewable energy is now the cheapest energy source. And that's as true for the United States as it is for the rest of the world. And what's really important to recognize is that renewable energy is actually outcompeting not only new coal plants and new gas plants, but also existing ones. It's getting increasingly cost ineffective to keep a coal plant or a gas plant running when you can just build new renewable energy and have cheaper power. In its projection for electricity capacity additions in 2021, the US, Envi the US Energy Information Agency projected that fully 81% of all new energy additions in the US this year will be renewable energy, solar, wind, and batteries. Just 16% is projected to be natural gas, and that's likely to continue declining. So as the, the utility or the supposed utility of carbon capture for coal disappears and for natural gas disappears, we're seeing more and more arguments from proponents of this technology that we need to build up this massive infrastructure to take on emissions from harder to reach sources like industrial emissions. Industrial emissions are actually significant, but it's really worth looking at the analysis of those emissions that the proponents of CCS themselves have done, including an analysis that was done by a team, including Chevron researchers. What that team found was when they actually looked at industrial sector emissions, in the vast majority of industries, only a tiny fraction of the actual emissions from that industry were reachable from CCS. If you looked at refining with nearly 110 megatons of emissions, only about 20 were potentially feasibly reachable from CCS. The same story applied for chemicals and for metals. And the Chevron analysis ultimately concluded that looking at the industrial emissions overall, 87.2% of those emissions were actually coming from the grid, coming from the energy that goes into, into powering industrial processes. And the Chevron team acknowledged, you know what, we're not gonna analyze those because there are probably other ways to get to those emissions like electrifying the grid. So that's a massive amount of the industrial emissions immediately wiped out from consideration. They then looked at more than 1,400 industrial facilities recognized by EPA around the world or across the US. And of those 1,400 facilities, they ended up finding only 123 where there was some potential to use CCS effectively. And even within those 123 facilities, they could only capture about 68.5 megatons of carbon a year. That was less than 10% of the amount from the 14, 1,400 facilities that they looked at and only a tiny fraction of all US industrial emissions. But that's only part of the problem because even assuming that you can capture the CCS, most places are not built near CCS storage. And that means pipelines. Currently, there are a total of five thousand miles of CO2 pipelines in the United States, most of them concentrated in West Texas in oil and gas fields there. Proponents of CCS imagine a world where we're building 25,000 to 65,000 miles of new pipelines in the next few decades. And unlike the current CO2 pipelines, these pipelines would run through communities across the country and they would run through inhabited areas uh, through towns, through ranches, um, past community centers. And because 
it's really important to recognize that the number of places where you can actually effectively store CCF, CO2 are quite limited. And this means that the pipelines are gonna concentrate overwhelmingly on a handful of places. N Nebraska is one of them. Um, the others tend to focus on sending the, the CO2 to West Texas and Southern Louisiana. And that means we're seeing an intense concentration of CC act, CCS activity and proposals concentrated on a relatively small number of areas. We're seeing, Jane is, uh, Carolyn is going to talk about the situation in the Midwest. I wanna talk very briefly about the situation in the South because we're seeing massive proposals for C C CCS development and CO2 pipelines in Louisiana's Cancer Corridor and from, from ExxonMobil in the Gulf Coast of Texas. But those pipelines carry some really significant risks. Although people assume that CO2 is safe, when you condense it to the pressures that it has to be under to be shipped in pipelines, it becomes a fundamentally different substance. It is highly corrosive. Um, and if it becomes contaminated with moisture or with, with hydrogen sulfide, it becomes even more corrosive. And that creates the risks of catal catastrophic pipeline fractures of the kind that you saw in that test. And these, these pipeline fractures have real consequences. In February of 2020, a pipeline, a CO2 pipeline exploded outside of Yazoo County, Mississippi. It sent 300 people, 300 people were evacuated. 45 people were sent to the hospital. A first responder who showed up described people wandering around like zombies and frothing at the mouth. Why? because CO2 is an asphyxiant and it's also an intoxicant, which means when you're initially exposed to CO2, you can become too inebriated and incapacitated to move to safety. And if you don't move to safety, you can die within minutes. And that's why it's really important to recall the scale of that test because the next eruption we see may not be out in a field, it may be next to a school next to a community center, next to a farm. And even once the CO2 gets through the pipeline, you're left with the question of where to store it. And that you're left with the question of CO2 injection. And this is literally a situation of choose your poison, literally. 80% of CO2 is destined for enhanced oil recovery, which means that CO2 is injected simply to produce more oil, which will be burned and release more carbon dioxide. Increasingly, we see proposals to inject the CO2, not for EOR, but into saline aquifers. This is important because if the pressure in a saline aquifer isn't carefully controlled, injecting CO2 can cause seismicity, which means earthquakes. It can cause groundwater contamination, either from the CO2 or from the brine, that the CO2 displaces, or it could lead, lead to fractures of the cap rock, which could lead to massive CO2 leases, releases, which could be both toxic and bad for the climate. So what do you do to reduce the risk of fractures? Well, you have to control the pressures. And in a saline aquifer, that means that the only way that you can safely inject CO2 in is to pull massive quantities of produced water out. These are also known as brines. And people who have been in, fight, in fracking fights and pipeline fights before will recognize produced water and brines because we see them a lot in, in the oil and gas industry. We see them a lot in pipeline fights. Um, and unlike in the oil and gas context, this, these produced waters can't easily be pumped back into the reservoir they came out from. That means seeing them pumped into land, seeing pumped into landfills, or scattered on roads for salt control, which could be a problem if, as is often the case, the brines are radioactive. And that brings me to a last and really fundamental point and a fundamental problem with CO2 injection that is receiving very little attention. This country alone has 10 million wells. 10 million, and that's, that's just an estimate. It could be many more. 
The number of documented wells, however, is much smaller. Many, many wells have been lost to history. I, in, in preparing this presentation, I found a report on Louisiana from 1911 that noted, you know, that, 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 that described the massive number of wells at a single site in Louisiana in 1908. And a huge proportion of those wells in 1908 were already abandoned, they had never produced, or their history was already unknown, and that's a century ago. Um, this is critically important because when you pump CO2 into those reservoirs, it makes the water more corrosive, more acidic, and it can corrode not only the, the rocks in the ground, but the cement in wells. So if you have an unknown well bore, anything pen penetrating that cap rock, the risks for catastrophic failure increase incrementally. And those risks won't fall e evenly on all of us. As with too many of the risks we've seen in our fossil economy, they will fall disproportionately on vulnerable communities, communities of color, and communities that have been the subject of environmental racism for far, far too long. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. It would be helpful if I could actually get my video back on and my mute button off. So I apologize for that little glitch. Uh, thank you, Carol, for that presentation. Honestly, just like with tar sands, when that first came on the scene for many of us on the front lines, we had to hear from experts and learn so then we could go out and organize in the community. And I feel like we are literally living that moment right now. You and I know uh, Kurt's coming up next and then Carolyn are just teaching us uh, so many things that we need to know about these particular risks so then we can effectively fight them as organizers. So I just wanna thank you for all of your work. And please everyone, uh, in the follow-up email, Mark will definitely make sure to link to all the organizations of our uh, speakers tonight, including the report that uh, Carol's group did, which is a must read if you're going to start fighting these projects. Uh, next up is Kurt. Kurt is the founder and director of the Climate Investigations Center, and he's a researcher, a media spokesperson, and climate activist for over 20 years. You might know his work from Greenpeace. He was the one who started the uh, the website and research project called Exxon Secrets, which really helped expose a lot of the fake AstroTurf organizations, as well as organizations that seemed reputable that Exxon was funding over the years in order to diminish the work of climate scientists around climate change. So we're excited to have Kurt join us tonight. I'll turn it over to you, Kurt. We might have lost Kurt. Let me double check the uh, attendees here, see if he's waiting there. I can also throw it to Carolyn if Kurt somehow got the glitches. Hello, everybody. <laughs> let's, go, let's go to Kurt for the moment. Or let's go, sorry, let's go to Carolyn for the moment. Okay, great. Okay, Carolyn, I hope you're ready because we're throwing Hi. you a curveball. You're up next. <laughs> Carolyn, uh, some of you actually on the webinar may know Carolyn up close and personal because she has helped several grassroots organizations and landowners fight pipelines uh, with her legal expertise. She's the executive director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. She's previously worked at Sierra Club on a range of environmental issues and has helped fight the Dakota Access Pipeline in Iowa. I know Carolyn up close and personal because she has helped bold on many issues and we're really proud and honored to have her with us tonight as an expert. Carolyn, you're up. Thank you. What a, what a treat to be with such uh, wonderful people. And um, you're in for a treat with Kurt as well. Um, and hello, pipeline fighters and fracking fighters. Um, uh, you're all on the side of the angels and so glad to be uh, working with you on this. So I'm going to do a slalom through a lot, of, a lot of material, and I'm going to violate all the PowerPoint uh, principles and um, uh, actually um, uh, have too many words on these. So 
my deep apologies for that. And I wanna tell you about four elements of carbon capture and storage if you didn't pick it up from Carol's wonderful uh, presentation. The first is you capture it from a smokestack or the equivalent, then you transport it through a pipeline and we'll be focusing on that in my presentation. Then you store it deep below, below ground or you use it to recover more oil. Don't forget that little factoid. And then you rake in the public subsidies and tax credits. If you wanna know why Exxon is so thrilled about this, it's because they get to not only maintain their, um, their damage to the earth, but they're gonna to get to be uh, get paid for it um, through public subsidies and tax credits. So I wanna give you the punchline up front. The first is that carbon capture and storage won't work without pipelines. And the second is that CO2 pipelines are what will allow the fossil fuel industry to continue damaging our communities and climate while using public money to do so. So Midwest, the Midwest is a target for carbon capture and storage. It allows ethanol plants to stay in business and claim that the ethanol produced is a low carbon fuel for purposes of especially California standard. It's uh, setting up an extensive system of existing, uh, it, it's using an extensive system of existing pipeline rights of way that go both to North Dakota and to Illinois, um, other, some other states, but primarily following the route of Dakota Access and Keystone Excel. Um, and then the politics of the Midwest are really supportive of these. You heard a little bit from Jane about um, the landowners in Nebraska already getting letters. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what's going on um, in a minute um, in all of those states. So I want you to see uh, two things. One is the ethanol facilities in this little Midwest region that we'll be talking about and also where the saline formations are in, in our area. And if you look at the slide of the ethanol facilities, you will see that they map on almost exactly onto the Dakota Access route, which goes from that little yellow orange dot um, at the corner of Illinois and Iowa. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know your geography because you're from, oh, some state that you know, considers us flyover, country. Um, it's in the very bottom right corner of Iowa, which is the rectangle, the little rectangle um, there, and then cuts across almost exactly uh, to South Dakota and North Dakota, where all those black dots are. And that's the path of Dakota access. And then you'll see the uh, sites where there are saline uh, formations in the geology. So I want to tell you about um, how how, what a fast track this is on, um, at least from our perspective. So Nebraska has passed a pretty astonishing legislation um, that blindsided a lot of people. And I'll go through a couple of points about that legislation in a minute. Keystone Excel pipeline rights of way have not been terminated. So those easements uh, that farmers either sold or had taken through eminent domain have not been terminated, even though the Keystone pipeline has been. Um, and there's a contract for carbon capture and storage on an ethanol plant in Nebraska. North Dakota has the only state bank in the country and the Bank of North Dakota refused to provide a very risky loan for Project Tundra, which is going to provide carbon capture and storage for a coal plant. And the legislature in North Dakota went around the Bank of North Dakota and said that they would guarantee that loan. More public money supporting a really bad idea. And North Dakota has been granted primacy um, by US EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, for deep well injection. And what that means is they have jurisdiction and authority over deep well injection uh, that's been granted by the federal government. So the state is now in control of those permits. And in Iowa, we have a task force for carbon sequestration that was just appointed, had its first meeting this week. There are no environmentalists. It seems to be a way to generate subsidies for um, the industry. And it is also gonna seek ways to streamline and minimize any kind of regulation that would govern carbon capture and storage. This is a picture of an ethanol plant, just so you know 
that they would be adding the carbon capture on top of that um, to capture the CO2. So the CO2 pipeline from Iowa and North Dakota, um, it's an Iowa company led by a man named uh, Bruce Rastetter. And it's a $2 billion effort, dollar effort. And it looks like now they're doubling the uh, presumed cost of this to $4 billion uh, to capture uh, the carbon dioxide from ethanol plants and pipe it to North Dakota. They would gather carbon dioxide from 17 ethanol plants. Um, it's gonna be compressed into a liquid form at the plants and then send it um, through these feeder pipelines to a larger pipeline that will extend across the upper Midwest. This is according to the Bismarck Tribune. The project adds to a growing list of carbon capture and storage projects in North Dakota. And if you know anything about North Dakota, its primary source of funding for its government is the fossil fuel industry. And so this will prop up um, the finances of North Dakota by keeping uh, the oil and gas industry alive and well. Um, they have done quite a bit of research in North Dakota and claim that um, uh, it's, uh, the geology is great in North Dakota. And as I mentioned, the primacy has already been established and industry likes that. So there's a second pipeline planned, um, Texas-based navigator CO2 Ventures says it needs to expand its existing proposal by 50% because um, they've already got more than they uh, more commitments than uh, they had originally planned, and so that company plans on uh, accepting carbon dioxide uh, from uh, uh, again ethanol, but some others, um, and they are planning primarily on sequestering it in Illinois. And if you know, the end of Dakota Access ends in Illinois, so it's again. Um, uh, lining up with the Dakota Access rights of way. And uh, they've got 2 billion and 4 billion in cost estimates for these various pipelines. Imagine what 6 billion would do um, to generate uh, clean energy um, that did not just further the fossil fuel industry. So industry is telling us what a great thing this is and why is it? Um, it's wonderful um, that North Dakota is so ready to regulate this because CO2 can be used to extract more oil from that shale. Um, and then they're just gonna ship it back down through D Dakota Access. So you've got this um, feedback loop of, of sending CO2 up to North Dakota, using it to extract more oil, and then sending it down through Dakota Access. They're talking about the a number of tonnage um, uh, that they can um, uh, submit. And I would offer to you that that is more advertising talk. That is not a verified number, the, the millions of tons of CO2 that they think um, they could generate. Um, Summit um, uh, Carbon Solutions, the main company uh, in Iowa that's promoting carbon capture and storage and building these pipeline, this one pipeline, is um, that it, the construction of the of the project would take 16 months and get this, 10,000 temporary jobs. And they will use that 10,000 temporary jobs as the argument of its great economic benefit to Iowa. And they expect the uh, project to be operational um, in, a, in a, just a couple of years. Um, so uh, they've also uh, are clear that they explore are exploring injecting the gas into those depleted oil fields. I wanted to give you a picture of what we went through with Dakota Access. This is a picture of the construction of Dakota Access on a farm in Iowa. And this is right above the Des Moines River in Boone County, which is, uh, supplies the drinking water for the capital of Iowa. Imagine putting a carbon dioxide pipeline next to this in that right of way how big that right of way will have to be. So Nebraska uh, is moving forward with uh, um, uh, the uh, Bruce Rastetter uh, Summit uh, Carbon Solutions uh, Plan. And um, they are anticipating that this will be the largest carbon capture and sequestration project in the world. Um, uh, my guess is the galaxy as well. Um, and it's uh, uh, 
going to be capturing, capable of capturing 10 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, when it's done. Green Plains is going to be making an initial investment in Summit Carbon Solutions to help fund development of the project. Um, so track that in Nebraskans. I wanted to just review that legislation that I described because it's gonna box us in. Um, and I wanna show you how it does that. So Nebraska declares geologic storage of CO2 to be in the public interest. And right now they're signaling that that language signals to regulators that you better not block this um, through any kind of equivocation because it is already deemed to be in the public interest. They will have to use other people's property. So the language, uh, the small type is the actual language from the uh, legislation itself. So it requires, according to the legislature, cooperative use of surface and subsurface property interests and the collaboration of property owners. Notice that they are going to uh, gain access to the subsurface property interests in some cases if they want to store CO2 below your property. They will have to use eminent domain. And note that what eminent domain means. It means that the landowner has not given their consent to this pipeline. And it, set, it recognizes that in the legislation, it says obtaining consent from all owners may not be feasible. So they're setting up the right to uh, take your land through eminent domain, even when you want to be a good steward of that land and protect it from something like a CO2 pipeline. They also think it's a reasonable and beneficial use of the deep earth where they might inject that CO2. They say right up front that it's a reasonable and beneficial use of the deep earth. So it parallels that's in the public interest. They're already signaling that these res reservoir estates, what the legislation calls a reservoir estate, which is that deep uh, uh, below the earth's surface, um, the, where they would inject the CO2. And um, so they're uh, already planning on transferring your rights to that reservoir estate, if you own the land above it, to these CO2 companies, because it's in the public interest and it's already been deemed a reasonable and beneficial use of the deep earth. So uh, we have our work cut out for us with that kind of language. The bill goes on and but what I wanted to do is show you where uh, water protectors, climate activists are up against something. There's also been a pre-feasibility study done for a carbon capture and sto a, a storage facility near Sutherland, Nebraska. And the pre-feasibility study was done under the Department of Energy's uh, initiative. And um, what they showed was that th this is not a really good idea, um, that, that even with all the tax credits, and all of that other stuff that probably would not cover the full project costs. And um, that the uh, site itself is not really ready to support a carbon capture and storage project. And that there's not been adequate public outreach. So keep up the pressure. Don't let that carbon capture, uh, that storage facility um, be sited near Sutherland. I wanted to just uh, mention a couple of things about how different CO2 pipelines are uh, or, or similar to oil pipelines. So most of the pipelines in the uh, Midwest are uh, either tar sands or crude oil. We of course have some natural gas pipelines. Um, they're not structured as master uh, limited partnerships, at least the two um, that I've seen. Uh, that doesn't mean that they won't be uh, converted to that or absorbed by a master limited partnership. But the master limited partnership is a, uh, a corporate form that requires you to pass on the profits to the unit holders, which are the equivalent of shareholders. So it, it changes the uh, equation a little bit for intervening financially. They're following the playbook for Dakota Access um, and some other pipelines by making sure that they have the contracts with the ethanol plants um, to take their carbon, which adds to the idea that there's uh, a need for these pipelines. They've got the contracts, there's a need. 
So uh, the regulators in places like Iowa just roll over and approve them because oh, the contracts, they've got contracts. Uh, the CO2 pipelines will use the oil pipelines easements. Um, and uh, by the way, the CO2 pipelines have different specifications than the oil pipelines. As uh, Carol mentioned, they be, the, the CO2, when it meets uh, impurities and water, actually become quite corrosive and acidic. So you can't just replace a, a crude oil pipeline. Uh, you can't just take car, uh, the oil out of a pipeline and start shooting CO2 through it. They really have different specifications for their construction. So CO2, if we did this just from coal fired power plants, you would move more liquids than all the oil and uh, industry moves today. So the key pipeline issues, eminent domain, they're gonna do these pipeline corridors uh, pipeline corridors have been pushed by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, which is the Koch brothers um, effort. CO2 and water is corrosive. They need to be made out of materials that won't corrode. And a ruptured CO2 pipeline could asphyxiate anyone in the vicinity. So my, I think this is my last slide. I, how, how do you decide if a technology is the right thing to choose? You know, we're gonna be told we have to have this. So the first question is, does nature have a solution for this problem? All right, let's just assume that on the scale, the scale of the CO2 problem, um, that nature does not have a, a solution for carbon dioxide. So no, uh, 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 or it, it, no. Um, and uh, if, if there's, uh, are you trying to fix a problem another technology has caused? Yes, we are trying to solve a problem that the fossil fuel industry has caused. So then we're up in that box, that second yes, in the upper right corner of your screen, then stop the technology that caused the problem. We need to stop the fossil fuel industry rather than putting on band-aids when what we need is a major end to the technologies. So with that, um, I just want to give my credits. Um, I got these various slides from places and I wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for that amazing presentation. And again, just a reminder, uh, these slides and entire recorded presentation will go out to everyone who signed up for the webinar this evening. So we do have Kurt, so I'm gonna quickly pass it on to him uh, so we can get some questions as well. We are running a little bit over time. We said this would be an hour, so it may be about 10 minutes over so we can still engage in some questions. And I know we wanna talk about easements for a little bit. So Kurt, the floor is yours. Hey, sorry, my uh, my internet collapsed right when I was supposed to come on. So um, you, these guys have covered most of what I was going to talk about. And uh, if I can find my, uh, my slides now, um, the main thing is we're up against a, um, there we go. Is that visible now? I'm uh, looking for me. Can you guys see that? Okay. Um, are you seeing my slides? Just making sure. Yes. yes. Great. Okay. So, uh, you know, you have, um, I was supposed to just explain the technology a little bit, but I'll go quickly here because we want to get to some questions. So you have these various things that we are, a lot of jargon here, carbon capture and storage. Sometimes you'll hear carbon capture and utilization and storage because they want to make it seem useful. Uh, under the Bush administration, they started a whole um, coal combustion utilization program at, at um, DOE. Sequestration is another term you've heard. It just means putting the genie back in the bottle, like tucking this stuff away. Direct air capture is yet another term, which means grabbing it out of the existing air with the giant machine that would use a lot of energy to grab carbon dioxide that's just floating by. And then enhanced oil recovery, as you heard from Carol, is using carbon dioxide to get more oil out, which is not necessarily keeping the carbon dioxide down. And then Jane, you asked me to talk about farming and, um, and uh, you know, soils and things, which is also part of capturing carbon potentially. And that term sometimes is natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions. I grabbed a couple of diagrams. You've seen more of these, you know, some of them in other, the other guys' presentations, but basically they're trying to tell us that they can take it, 
safely from an existing CO2 pollution source of which there are many types, steel mills, cement kilns, ethanol, refineries, you name it. Um, capture it and put it underground forever. It has to stay down there forever, remember. And that's uh, Carol's point about all the other punctures. Here are some, these are all diagrams from people who are big champions of this. So here's a simplified, you know, the dirty facility on the right is just letting it go up, but we can add these magic pipes. And one of the people, when somebody asked a question on the, on the chat, how much energy does that take? A whole lot more. It takes up to 25 to 40% more energy to add this chemical facility onto the existing polluting facility. Here's what direct, here's a diagram of direct air capture. You literally have these big fans and sponges that'll suck it out of the air. Tons of energy involved there. And then this, these people wanted to make sure you weren't thinking it was like fracking because it stays down there and it's, it's nice and safe. I'm being really cynical in tone, you can hear. Forests, yes, we need to do that too. We need to protect soil erosion. We need to provide incentives for land stewardship and all that but not to trade it for more pollution. There's simply not enough land on earth. Here's one proof of that from 20 years ago, the utilities were trying to convince us we could just plant enough trees. And they started the Utilitree Carbon Company, um, signed American Electric Power Synergy and Clico that, and run by the Edison Electric Institute. So the, my main point here is scale. Uh, you've heard it, Carol said it, we have, 5,000 miles of existing pipelines, all of it's used for EOR. The study that was done last year by Princeton to back the Biden plan said they mapped out an additional 60,000 miles of pipelines, but all of that would only handle 15% of current greenhouse gas pollution. And Lee Raymond of Exxon and others have said, you're gonna need a pipeline system exist to, equal to all that exists for everything else. And he said, try to build that. So back to these maps, just dwell on this for a second. This middle line here down the middle of the country is mapped by Princeton as a 48 inch in diameter trunk line that would not even carry all the carbon dioxide that it needs to. They had to adjust the model. That's as big as the Trans-Alaska pipeline that filled the Exxon Valdez. It's a massive structure. Um, it's bigger than DAPL. So, and then you see they've got lines conveniently tracing sort of down, straight down through the East Coast, all the way across the Adirondacks up here, straight across New England. There's no way you can build pipelines safely through these areas. These maps in the Princeton study were literally drawn by hand. And then the other set of maps that the Council on Environmental Quality has just sent in a, in a report to Congress have different pipelines heading everywhere. So the main and then the other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is how many of these projects have failed already. We have had, we've heard this song for 20 years, lots of federal money, lots of your money has gone into it. And all these projects that have been well-meaning and seemingly more than greenwashing have collapsed under their own weight. So we have a growing and immense uh, rural environmental justice issue emerging. Where are these pipelines gonna go? The path of least resistance, where there are hopefully fewer people to be hurt, but this, this, um, this is what they'll plan to do. The least cost and least politically uh, loud people will get stepped on here. So we are about to launch an investigation tomorrow morning that will, um, we're gonna launch FOIA requests in every state that has lines on these maps. And I would hope that you uh, pipeline warriors out there will take up the charge and press those questions at a local level. We're gonna ask, have you considered people when you're designing this? Are you considering safety? Are you preparing local emergency response personnel for dealing with this? Who's liable? Uh, all those questions. And I'm sure we're gonna get some interesting answers. We're also gonna send a FOIA into the Council on Environmental Quality asking the same questions. So, Stay tuned tomorrow morning, and I'll make sure to get you guys all the link to, um, to that work. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. And these were amazing presentations. I, Mark's going to start to ask some questions. Before I turn it over to Mark, and he'll throw it to an individual of our panelists. Um, but obviously, if you uh, have more information to add, uh, fellow speakers, to the question that gets asked to somebody, please also chime in. Uh, so before I hand it to Mark, I just want to say, 
you know, when you look at these maps with all of the proposed pipelines that the uh, companies want to build, it can be very depression, depressing and almost say, well, it's inevitable, let's just roll over. I just want to remind folks that that's what the tar sands uh, expansion pipeline map looked like 10 years ago as well. They were going to have four tar sands pipelines running through Nebraska. They were going to be twinning various pipelines all over it. That's a technical term for saying if there's a pipeline in the ground, we'll just use the current easement to put another one in. There is no question that this is a huge risk, but I'm also confident that we have the organizing power to push back. Uh, Kurt is exactly right. Big oil and fracked gas companies, they have a playbook that they use, and we've seen it up close and personal all across this country as people have been fighting pipelines. They try to go to communities that they think are politically powerless or communities that are not going to stand up and push back. And I think, you know, TransCanada and all the corporations that were wanting to build these tar sands pipelines across the country uh, realized that actually people in farm country do push back and stand up and do it uh, with unlikely alliances. And we're going to do the same with these pipelines as well. We know that Keystone XL currently still owns easements all across our state, even though they said they're not going to build the pipeline and the pipeline got its permits pulled by President Biden. And we also know that our landowners are still in negotiation, at least 69 of them with TransCanada to get their easements back but that there's still hundreds more in our state that TransCanada owns. And so this is a wake up call for everybody on this webinar that even if a pipeline gets canceled, like by Halia pipeline, for example, or maybe Mountain Valley soon, Atlanta Coast is one that got canceled. Jordan Cove is another one that may be canceled soon. Those companies own those easements forever. They can transfer ownership to anybody else they want to and the landowner doesn't get a say. So if that's not a wake up call to Congress to start getting their act together to change laws, I don't know what is. When we're talking about land justice and environmental justice, it starts with some of these pipeline fights and not having landowners and tribal communities and communities of color always be the one that are shouldering the responsibility to push back and stand up. It's time that our state senators, our state house members and Congress also stand up and start doing the job of protecting the land and water for once. So with that, Mark, I'll turn it to you for questions. Um, thanks, Jane. And thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we have just a few minutes here for questions and I'm gonna try and consolidate a couple of these. See about four of them that um, cover the topic of labor and jobs. So I'm just gonna try and consolidate a couple of these. Mary in West Virginia asks, given that a key reason for pushing carbon capture and storage now is that pipeline workers are howling about their lost jobs as we block oil and gas pipelines, Thus, unions support this massive boondoggle. Should we make the case that these workers should all be put to work replacing or repairing the distribution lines in cities for both water and gas, many of which are old and leaky and also often made of lead? Uh, also, Steve says on the subject of unions, there are a lot of unions who oppose these pipelines and this new greenwashing scheme who would be willing to support this effort. I am such a union member. Would you be interested in a future workshop on how to engage unions and involve them in the struggle? By the way, I founded Labor for Standing Rock so I can speak from experience. Um, I think we all know the blue-green quote-unquote alliance of labor unions and some environmental groups um, has had a uh, somewhat checkered history on support for uh, this technology. So uh, if anyone wants to grab that one. I can start and then hopefully some others will chime in as well. So first, our fight has never been against labor unions. And I think everybody on this call will agree with that. Our fight is never with hardworking men and women who work in the fossil fuel industry. Our fight is with the corporations who are constantly trying to wedge farmers, ranchers, tribal communities, environmentalists against labor unions because we agree on every other issue. So, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that this is yet another uh, issue where they're trying to wedge us against each other. It is true, and the Biden administration has said very clearly over and over again on uh, the amount of jobs that would come out of replacing lead pipes. Um, as well as pulling up decommissioned oil and fracked gas pipelines, which is a whole other frontier of potential jobs. Those jobs clearly weigh, um, far outweigh the number of jobs that would go into these CO2 pipelines. Um, on average, when an oil pipeline, or I'm sure this, the job equation is going to be similar for CO2 pipelines, when they go through a state, it's roughly about a thousand construction jobs over a year. Um, and then pipelines are usually anywhere from 
five to 35 permanent jobs once they are in operation. Clearly, there's more jobs in replacing lead pipes as well as transitioning our country fully to a clean energy economy. Yeah, and if, if I could just add on and amplify one key point about that, you know, I mentioned that this country has 10, you know, 10 mil, an estimated 10 million wells, many of them are abandoned. And that, that is true for pipelines and infrastructure as well. One of the reasons Louisiana is being targeted is it's got a lot of natural gas pipelines that are no longer being used. So you want to give people pipeline jobs get, and oil industry get jobs, give them jobs, shutting in those wells, closing them down, disassembling and dismantling those pipelines. And the difference is there's a lot more of that work to do. Um, those jobs are gonna last a long time. And even more importantly, when you build a pipeline, what have you got at the end of the day? You've got a pipeline that is dividing a community, pipeline rendering land on either side of it useless. When you take those pipelines apart, when you remediate a well, what you get back is the land, the community connections that are gonna create more opportunities for more people. Thanks, Mark. I think we're ready for the next one. All right, great. Um, Frank, our friend Frank asks, uh, the connection to the ethanol industry has the potential to be difficult in farm country. Do folks have strategies for addressing this connection? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, speaking from an organization, I know we're um, not aligned with all environmental groups bold on our position on ethanol, which we support ethanol and have been big supporters of ethanol over the years as a way to get off uh, traditional fossil fuels. Um, so this clearly is going to be a bit of a different political environment uh, where I think ethanol companies were on our side to stop tar sands pipelines because tar sands was competing with ethanol. Um, so this means that we're going to have to do more work and we're going to have to really uh, join hands with uh, folks who see the risks of these, in particular the landowners and tribal communities, uh, especially in those plain states where all those uh, could potentially go. Uh, but I don't. I think we shouldn't sugarcoat the fact that perhaps some traditional allies that were with us, or non-traditional allies that were with us on Keystone XL or stopping other uh, tar sands and oil pipelines, may not be with us this time. But we may get other allies, and that's the job of organizers. Thanks. Um, we have another question uh, from Sarah. Uh, is entangling the financials between governments and oil and gas industries part of the long-term solution to reduce fossil fuel expansion? Are there paths to achieve that? I think Carol is going to jump at that one. Yeah, I think the simple and very clear answer is yes. One of the most effective ways to address the climate crisis, to address the role of fossil fuels, is for the government to stop plow, plow, plowing massive subsidies into, into fossil fuel industries. Uh, we talked about the infrastructure bill, but that's only a tiny example of a flood of subsidies that flows continuously into this sector. And so one of the surest ways to accelerate the transition um, is to choke off those subsidies um, because it's a lot of what's keeping this industry limping along. Thanks, Carol and Sarah. Um, here's a question from Wally. Is there uh, non or anti alec legislation that could be proposed to put protections in place against this public good project concept? Um, and thanks us for outlining the state-based legislation that we're supposed to be looking out for. I can take that. I mean, the, the one important strategy, and I don't think any of us have covered it, is who's liable for this stuff? Who's gonna cover the risk? And I think a state-based strategy would be to turn around what the oil industry wants now is to say, this is a public, this is being mandated by the government, paid for by public funds. It's, we're gonna make money. We're gonna be charging people to move stuff through a new public sewer system for carbon dioxide, essentially. So we wanna be paid, but we don't wanna pay if something goes wrong. And we don't wanna be responsible for the disposal sites as you know they're gonna put it down there and then leave, that, leave us on the hook. So I think a state-based strategy to, to push the cost back on the polluters, we'll stop them in their tracks. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Kurt. And that's exactly the type of thing that's still not in place for 
oil and tar sands, folks will remember that tar sands have a tax uh, loophole in the IRS. So they don't even pay into the oil spill liability fund because they got lobbyists to convince the IRS it wasn't oil. So therefore they don't have to pay into the oil spill liability funds, which never fully covers the oil spills anyway. And we have no decommissioning fund. So every pipeline that has to be decommissioned or old oil well, uh, that does fall on the shoulders of taxpayers and landowners because we have no uh, federal or state-based resource that uh, you know these uh, counties and landowners can tap into that the companies you know, are the ones who put up the money. So there's a lot of work that can be done at the state level to get ahead of this now uh, in order to get those policies in place, as well as at the county level. Uh, folks who have fought pipelines know that pipeline zoning is critical. Uh, folks have worked hard on that in Nebraska, in York, and Holt County, and we need a lot more uh, counties picking up that uh, baton. And Pipeline Safety Trust has sample zoning, and the Pipeline Fighter Hub has sample zoning as well. And this is now something that we're going to work on as well for carbon capture sample zoning. Um, thank you. I think we have time for one or two more. Randy uh, asks, they're proposing a carbon capture storage and salt under the Ohio River in Ohio Valley near Wheeling. How could this impact the river, the water quality and safety? Should this be brought up to the public? Yes, it has potential to uh, affect water um, in many ways. And um, we are now working with a hydrogeologist who is helping us understand the implications of um, the steep well injection uh, for uh, fresh water. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways that this can head south. Um, so, uh, meaning can go really bad. And um, uh, we want to protect our drinking water. We want to protect, um, you know, that deep, deep earth. I want to make a point that has not been made. Um, and it's something that my colleague, Sandra Steingraber, has pointed out. And that is that there's an entire ecology in the deep earth. And we are disrupting that with um, fracking uh, chemicals. And to inject carbon dioxide in that deep earth, um, we don't know what will happen with the acidification that uh, may occur down there. And we don't know how that deep uh, subsurface environment is connected to our uh, you know, on the surface environment. So we approved um, uh, CFCs, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, before we knew there was a big ozone layer in the upper atmosphere and it started to eat a hole in it. We didn't even know about that. So uh, it seems to me that we need to do due diligence and, and really actually employ the precautionary principle in not doing something stupid um, that has permanent uh, uh, implications for generations to come, not just seven generations, but 10,000 generations. Thanks, Carol. That's a great point. Um, I think that's a good place to wrap up as well. And uh, I will toss it over to Jane, but just want to remind folks that uh, we will be sending out a uh, link to recording of this. And uh, I believe the Q&A should be embedded in that in some te technological by Zoom, but uh, I'll pass it back to Jane to, to sign us off for the evening. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Carol, Kurt, and Carolyn for joining us as our experts tonight for the Pipeline Fighters briefing. Uh, we'll look forward to the one next month where we'll hear from Pipeline Fighters around the country who have won their pipeline fights and how do they use that power that they built fighting a pipeline to continue building power um, against other fights and issues that they're facing in their communities. But I just wanna end on a note to say that we know organizing wins and we will never have as much money as big oil and fracked gas companies and now these CO2 pipelines have, but we have something that they need, that's the land. And when we organize people who live and work and love the land, that's when we can stop these pipelines. And BOLD and the Pipeline Fighters Alliance, as well as all the other groups that are on this call tonight, are gonna be right there with all the communities who need the resources and help to stand up to these projects that are gonna use eminent domain for their private gain and risk the land and water for generations to come. So don't get discouraged by those maps. 
Carol, thank you for terrifying me with that image of the pipeline exploding. And this means that we have work to do and we're ready to get that work done. So thank you everyone. Remember to sign up for the extracted press clips if you're not already getting those in your inbox every morning. And we look forward to partnering with you to stop these pipelines in your community. See y'all later.